Today's contemporary reading from Rabbi Dania Rutenberg on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world. We can never undo what we have done. We can never go back in time. We write history with our decisions and our actions. But we also write history with our response to those actions. We can leave the pain and the damage in our wake unattended, or we can do the work of acknowledging and fixing, to whatever extent possible, the harm we have caused. Repentance, teshuva, is like the Japanese art of kintsugi, repairing broken pottery with gold, you can never unbreak what is broken, but with the sincere and deep work of transformation, acts of repair have the potential to make something new. What might this look like when the pain is caused in our personal relationships, in the public eye, in the institutions of which we are a part, in our home, work and recreational spheres, in our country, in the criminal justice system, and beyond. Whether the suffering is a result of a private domestic misunderstanding, a betrayal, a corporate decision, or even genocide, there are ways to face what, what has happened and to move forward along the path of repentance. From truth that comes out of suffering. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the Pharisees went off and began to plot how they might trap Jesus by his speech. They sent their disciples to Jesus, accompanied by sympathizers of Herod, who said, Teacher, we know you're honest and teach God's way sincerely. You court no one's favor and don't act out of respect for important people. Give us your opinion then in this case. Is it lawful to pay tax to the Roman emperor or not? Jesus recognized their bad faith and said to them, why are you trying to trick me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin which is used to pay the tax. When they handed Jesus a small Roman coin, Jesus asked them, whose head is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. At that, Jesus said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but give to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were astonished and went away. For the love of God in Christ Jesus, I invite you to hold the 10 cent coin you were given when you entered the church this morning. I wonder when was the last time you held a coin in your hands? These days we're more likely to wave our card, present our phone, press enter on our computer or click on our tablet. What will future generations make of this gospel reading in years to come when coins no longer circulate. You will notice that on the coin is the face of Queen Elizabeth II, the reigning British monarch at the time it was minted. A few weeks ago, it was announced that the Royal Australian Mint is producing coins carrying the King Charles III I wonder what this says to our nation and, our first peop and the first peoples of this land. But I digress. The cultural context 
in which this gospel was spoken and ours today are vastly different. So it's not surprising that the message of Jesus or the writer of Matthew's gospel may have wished to communicate could be easily lost. Responding to the devious question posed by the Pharisees, Jesus asked, whose head and whose inscription is on the coin that is used to pay the tax? The Pharisees reply, Caesar's. Jesus responds with the oft-quoted phrase, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. However, if we were to hear this slightly, a slightly different translation, we might hear the profound teaching of Jesus amid the trap set by the Pharisees. As I understand it, in the Greek, we would hear whose image is engraved on the coin. Here, Jesus is referencing Genesis 1, 26 to 27. God said, let us make humankind in our image. In the divine image, God created them. So to spell out what would have been obvious to the hearers of Jesus' words, give to Caesar the image of Caesar, and give to God the image of God, your whole selves. A sincere gift of self to God, alongside a miserly coin to Caesar. So the Pharisees have created a win-lose situation, one in which Jesus would undoubtedly lose. If he agreed that it was lawful to pay the imperial tax imposed only on non-Romans, he would be siding with the oppressors and thus upsetting the Jews. Answering in the negative would antagonise the Roman authorities. The Pharisees were not interested in the tax question. Rather, they were trapping Jesus. Despite this, Jesus highlights that one has different obligations to the empire and to God, and that the two don't need to be in conflict. So with this in mind, I now turn to what we're commemorating today on the 22nd of October. It is the fifth anniversary of the National Apology to the Victims and Survivors of Institutional Child Sexual Abuse. This is the fourth National Apology in recent years. On the 13th of February 2008, the Prime Minister at the time, Kevin Rudd, offered an apology to the Stolen Generation. The 16th of November 2009, again it was Prime Minister Rudd who offered a national apology to the forgotten Australians and former child migrants. On the 21st of March 2013, the then Prime Minister Julia Gillard apologised on behalf of the Australian Government to people affected by the forced adoption or removal policies and practices. And then we come to the one we're celebrating today. Five years, after, uh, five years ago and ten months after the conclusion of the five-year Royal Commission, the then Prime Minister Scott Morrison offered the national apology to the victims and survivors of institutional child sexual abuse. Eniko Sands, in examining national apologies, argues that for a national apology to have any validity and credibility, it needs to include an acknowledgement of the injustices committed, an expression of remorse, a guarantee of non-repetition, be complemented by reparative action and refrain from appealing for forgiveness. The National Apology to the Victims and Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse confesses what was done and the harm caused, expresses remorse, commits to general actions to prevent further abuse of children, although it cannot guarantee that, this will never, that it will never happen again. And the government, through the National Redress Scheme, has taken some steps towards restitution. An apology has not been asked for. An apolo the apology does not ask for forgiveness. 
National apologies may well have their role, although this is contested. However, each marks a significant moment in our nation's history, and in the case of the national apology to the stolen generations, one could say a watershed moment. But like the Pharisees, are we focusing on the wrong thing, at least in our churches? Yes, I believe that apologies are important, very important. But are we failing to do the painful and necessary work of repentance and repair? If we don't intentionally attend to making amends following wrongdoing, we, we engage in a form of spiritual bypassing. So it is easy, personally and publicly, to see an apology as all that needs to be done. Frequently, we jump quickly to apologise before we have done the necessary preceding work. And then once the apology has been given, we believe that all is well, but the crucial work of making amends is left undone. We can see this clearly with the, national, with the apology to the stolen generations, the social and health problems in Indigenous communities, like imprisonment rates, lower levels of education, high unemployment, result from 235 years of colonising oppressive disadvantage. Kevin Rudd, on the 15th anniversary of that apology that he offered on behalf of the nation, saw that the apology was both a success and a failure. And he said, let us have the honesty and the courage to acknowledge both. At the time of the apology, the government committed to decreasing social inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians through closing the GAP initiative. But as a nation, we have failed dismally in all but two areas. And in some cases, the situation is deteriorating. Just this last week, there was another death in custody, a 16-year-old Indigenous boy on remand. Many apologies are really pseudo-apologies. They're inauthentic and cause further harm, particularly the type. I'm sorry if my words, actions, etc., have offended you. They perpetuate the win-lose dynamic of the Pharisees in today's gospel. It is the so in these so-called apologies, the speaker assumes no responsibility, nor acknowledge the harm done, nor there is no commitment to change or consideration of what would make things better. The person offering the apology may feel as if they have excused themselves for moaning any wrongdoing and the person hearing the pseudo-apology continues to feel diminished. So how can we make amends? What would we need to do collectively and individually if we were to go beyond an apology? And here I draw on the work of Rabbi Daniel Rottenberg, who we heard in our contemporary reading. In her recently published book on repentance and repair, making amends in an unapologetic world, Dania develops the five steps of repentance and repair offered by the medieval Jewish theologian, philosopher and physician, Moses Maimonides, and invites us on a path of repentance. Succinctly put, there are five steps. Confession, starting to change, restitution, apology, and transformation. You may recognise that most of these are within a genuine apo national apology. The first step is confession. Confession is not the same as an apology, although the national apologies do include confession. It's about acknowledging and owning the harm that's been done with a willingness to face it. It names and accepts without qualification diminishment of responsibility or excuses. Mamamides and Ruttenberg say it should be public or at least commensurate with the publicness of the, the harm done. This can be hard and painful. 
This is the work of truth-telling. Step two is starting to change, so we don't repeat what, we have, what has been identified as wrongdoing. This might involve, for example, tending unhealed wounds, addressing toxic behaviour, educating oneself or implementing systemic changes so the harm is not likely to continue. This is the work of building or rebuilding trust. The third step is making amends, restitution and accepting the consequences resulting from the harm done. This step occurs after the first step of confession and the step of committing to change, thus reducing the risk of further harm. Making amends is not about fixing, but committing to making things as right as possible. For some wrongs can never be fixed. This is the work of justice. It is only in step four that apology occurs. After confession, beginning to change and restitution. This is the work of relationality, of building or rebuilding relationships. The aim is to foster healing and repair while avoiding further harm. The one who has been harmed must always be the centre of the process. It requires humility and vulnerability on behalf of those who've caused harm. Relationships may be renewed and reconciliation may follow, but there should never be an expectation or a demand. Relationships may need to be released. This work of apology is about prioritising relationships. The final but ongoing step is where different choices are being consistently made. This is where life is transformed and flourishing begins. Without doing the work of confession, commitment to change, restitution and apology, one is likely to repeat the patterns of the past. This is the work of transformation leading to flourishing. So confession is the work of truth-telling, starting to change the work of rebuilding trust, making amends the work of justice. Apology is the work of establishing or releasing relationships, living differently, choosing differently, leading to flourishing for all. Notice that at all times, the focus is on the person who has caused that has caused harm is obligated to do. However, these same five elements, truth-telling, trust, justice, relationality, and flourishing, or truth, faith, justice, love, and hope, are vital also to those who've been harmed, particularly those who are still carrying the wounds of trauma. You may notice I have not spoken of forgiveness, and deliberately so. The work of forgiveness, if it is to be done, lies with those who have been harmed, and I'm very wary of someone who has caused harm asking for forgiveness. It can come across as an expectation or an obligation on those who have been harmed before they are in a place, if they ever get to a place, of offering forgiveness. It can be a form of coercion, manipulation. Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes forgiveness without the work of repentance as cheap grace. It is another example of spiritual bypassing, leaving the deep inner work undone. Christianity has much work to do in relation to its theology of forgiveness. So I return to the words of Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg. We cannot undo what we have done. We can never go back in time. We write history with our decisions and our actions. But we also write history with our responses to those actions. She goes on. Repentance is like the Japanese art of kintsugi, repairing broken pottery with gold. You can never unbreak what is broken, but with sincere and deep work of transformation, acts of repair have the potential to make something new. So I invite you to pause for a moment 
and take that coin in your hand. As we reflect on how we can move beyond glib or pseudo apologies and walk the path of repentance in our, our personal relationships, our homes, our places of work, our church, country, or internationally, thus making amends in our own apologetic world. You might like to take the coin home with you or place it in the offertory bag as you give to God the image of God, your whole self, the divine image that is you. Amen.